All right, good morning, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure this morning to welcome uh, Professor Barton Miller and Alyssa Hyman, both from uh, University of Wisconsin, and to talk about software security this, this morning. Uh, I won't, both are, are very distinguished in this field, and I'm happy to have them here presenting as part of our virtual institute because of the importance of uh, us developing our software right and this sort of being foundational then to everything on, of cyber security going above it. So with uh, that brief introduction, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Bart and Alyssa to talk to us some about uh, secure coding. Okay, Th thanks, thanks Vaughn, and good morning everyone. Um, I think Vaughn captured it correctly and say we're talking about the software development process. Um, under, underneath, you know, any, any security, if you're developing your own software, your own website, whatever, um, anything you develop can create vulnerabilities. Even after you've secured the network, you've secured your OS, you've secured your patches, you've got your identity, identity management right. If you develop software that has holes, um, that can create whole new sets of, uh, of security vulnerabilities. And, and we go in and we, we actually go in and find vulnerabilities in real systems and done a lot of really interesting places which we can talk about, uh, you know, Google Chrome and Wireshark and helping secure the international container shipping world, things like that. So feel free, we can, we can tell you all more about that. We wanna give you some technical background and as you've done in the past, feel free to chime in with questions if you bring them in with chat on will uh, will be your proxy and bring them forward to us. Okay, so I um, want to go through just real quickly um, an idea, which is how does how does the bad guy think about your software? Because and and this is, you know, this is this is stuff we've gotten from if you look at the really good intelligence teams whose job it is to break into systems. Um, they think about this idea of, of your software and calling owning the bits. And so let's, let's see if we can think a bit about that. Well, you know, just a quick picture, you know, uh, security people look at it differently and don't follow the obvious path. So, um, okay. So, um, so let's, let's think about the way an experienced attacker would approach uh, your, your software. So, um, they think of an exploit in, in, the, in, in the terms of manipulating the internal state of your program in a way you didn't expect. So, you know, for example, if somebody typed in their name on a web form and those characters appeared in an input buffer, if I type my name in a web form and it appeared in an input buffer on your software, um, I own the bits of your input buffer. The contents of your input buffers were determined by me, but that's okay because you wanted my input there. But if my input could go beyond the end of your input buffer, now I own more bits inside of your program that you didn't intend me to own. And so anytime I can change the state of your program in a way you didn't plan it, that's uh, an exploit. And, it's, it's, and this is literally the way an attacker, an experienced attacker thinks about manipulating your program. So, so the way this works is we follow a path. We start at the, all the places where you can touch the program, you can reach it and we'll talk about each, we'll talk about this in a little more detail. And this is called the attack surface. And before you can understand uh, how, to, how, to, how to create an attack, you have to understand where you can actually touch the program. Now that follows the program's program flow, the logic and you process the input coming from the user. You know, some people call the attack surface user input, but from, from a defensive point of view, we call it the attack surface. You process this, and then the question is, how can I affect your program's decisions inside till I get to some point in your code where I can cause something bad to happen? I go from being a normal user to being administrator. I now can grab a file, I can exfiltrate data, exfilling is a cool term, uh, stealing data from there, or I can <clears throat> spoof my behavior, all sorts of things. So this is. So we go from the external place where I can touch it through the logic into the place where I touch your program. So let's look at kind of a silly real world example. Um, and let's think of a bank, okay? So 
you know, we can start out by saying, well, the attack surface is walking in the front door and the path of the attack is, oh, I request cash. So the teller opens the drawer. My accomplice distracts the teller for a minute. They say, oh, there's Martians. And then I reach over the, I reach over the counter and take the money out of the drawer. And, and so the weaknesses in the system was the teller turned away and the counter was perhaps too narrow, allowed me to reach through, or maybe there's a big enough window. And the impact surface was the moment re removing the cash. And I can talk about other ones, the back door, you know, I try to open the back door. If I can get in, I look to see if the vault is open. And if there is, I grab the cash and go. And we can think of the weaknesses as perhaps you left the back door open and the vault open at the same time. And the cash was not in a locked cage. And so, so you get, so we're going through this kind of real world things and we have, um, we have other examples we can go on. Um, the last example is prob is kind of interesting because this is the attack surface here is a corrupt teller. They take the cash in the drawer, they hide it in their backpack and maybe the weaknesses are, they didn't do good background checks and they don't have sufficient inspections and cross checks. And, but this is, this is an interesting one because this is an insider threat which has its whole um, which has a whole other set of problems to deal with to try to secure against. All right, so that's just to get you thinking a little bit, but let's look in real world systems about tax service. You have a running program, <clears throat> some service, and data can arrive just from network request packets. Maybe you can upload input files. Maybe, uh, you're, maybe you're talking this thing through a web form and data is coming through a web form. Maybe the program is grabbing data from a database and you can affect the data in the database. And uh, if you know something about starting programs on hosts, and this is something that might be something um, more appropriate to like a cloud environment, you, uh, programs get started with environment variables and program options. So all these are places where you can touch the program and affect what it's going to do. And the program's job is to accept all of these and behave only in a predictable way. And anytime you can force the program out of a predictable behavior, then you have a chance of attacking it. So the attack surface is all the ways you can affect the behavior of the program. So direct attacks are most obvious. So perhaps, um, the, uh, perhaps the attacker sent a packet or a web form and I as a server read it and the packet is crafted in a very clever way to cause my program to misbehave. That's really obvious. But what's really interesting are things called in indirect attacks. And, and we've, we've actually done these to real systems. These happen all the time. And let me give you a uh, kind of an example of one kind of indirect attack. So <clears throat> user says a request to a server. Okay, that's fine. Except the server says that's a bad, that was a bad request. It's, it's, it was obviously a bad request. The server rejected it and wrote an error message to, to a log file. Okay, so far so good, totally normal, what we expect behavior. Except, um, and then the server sent back an error to the user saying, sorry, that was a terrible request. Okay, well, um, let's look. Um, and so sometime later that night, let's say every midnight, there's a program that wakes up and reads the log file looking for patterns, behaviors, reports, summaries of things that went wrong, maybe trying to do diagnosis on the system detecting errors. Okay. So that's, um, and that's, that's all reasonable there. Okay, so, but what happened was when I made the original request, inside the request was maybe my username or password that was a really weird string that the server rejected because it was obviously a bad username and it wrote to the log file. But that string, when it was read by the log file reader, caused it to misbehave. And I was also able to become administrator and get access to the log file server that's behind all the firewalls. So I sent a message to the server, the server wrote to the log file, but the attack happened later on. I indirectly attacked the, the log file reader. And this is, this is dangerous because it's a really inobvious flow of control. It's not, it wasn't clear there was an attack surface to the log file reader. And also 
those things tend to be written carelessly because they look like they're behind the firewall, they're safe, users can't read, reach them. So this, this is kind of an interesting form of attack. And we have found real examples of this. This is not just uh, us kind of waving our hands. Okay, <clears throat> so um, we go through the attack surface, we follow the flow of control of your program, and then the flaw in the flow of the control of your program can be interesting because um, you know, we're following the control, we're trying to follow the, understand the control flow. So that's all the, we call functions and methods and all your branches and loops and things like that. And it's also following how things are calculated in the program. So, you know, one variable is used in a calculation for the next thing, gets copied to a buffer for next thing and so on. So this is following the control and data flow. And this is pretty straightforward if you've, if you've done any programming, you know, you've, you've had to do this when you've been debugging. But it can be less obvious. <clears throat> so let's, well, let's look at an example of it first. So let's say the variable i came in from input. Well, the variable i was used as a, as a subscript. It affected which, which, which value from the buffer was taken to a. a was used in some calculation to calculate b. And b was used as some subscript into a table calculate the final answer. <clears throat> so we can just see the flow of control and maybe the attack is affected by following this flow control and data. But it can be less obvious than that. So let's look at this simple combination of, of statements. Say if the first character, if the buffer, if the character of position one in the buffer is letter A, set val to three, I'll set it to 25. <clears throat> so what we see here and and is that the, the, the value of the variable val is dependent upon um, input buffer, sub one. But there's no single place in the program where input buffer is assigned to val. It's through a combination of if statements, control statements, and data statements. And so this example looks really simple, but when you try to build software that analyzes your program to find problems in your code, these the fact that a statement here um, that's not part of the assignment statements can actually affect the value assigned to it <clears throat> makes this kind of analysis kind of hard to do. So just kind of a technical bit underneath. So now the impacts place is where in the program your, uh, the bad thing happened. So for example, maybe we've given um, the attacker unconstrained execution. So we've turned the server into a shell where they can type commands, or maybe where they can only run as a normal user that can now run as administrator, or maybe they've got access to files they shouldn't have access to, or maybe they can act um, as somebody else so they can act as an imposter forwarding stuff, <clears throat> or they can use this host for a uh, jumping off point for another attack or exposing information. These are all kinds of things that would be specific, specific attacks. <clears throat> Okay, so good time for any questions to come in before we jump into an example. Um, so in the previous example that you showed uh, where the value was being assigned, what is the problem over there, this one? <clears throat> well, this, this, this in itself is not a problem. This, this, is, this is an example of if this is an example of how to follow the logic of your program and what it's showing is let's say you wanted to build and there are these tools that scan your code to try to find problems in your code to help you out <clears throat> and attackers will try to do this <clears throat> too and you have to look at your code to try to figure out is there a flow of control from where the input comes in to the point where something bad might happen and the question is does the input affect the value of val Maybe that's an important question to ask to see is some later operation safe in your code. And <clears throat> if you look at the program, there's no place in your program where val is computed based on input buffer. But this little simple statement shows that the value of input buffer actually does affect the value of val. So this, this is basically showing there's a way. This is a small example in real programs this gets more obscured showing following the logic to actually see if the input affects some critical place in your code is not always that obvious to find. 
Right. Okay. Thanks. Other questions before we jump ahead? <clears throat> Okay, so let's talk, <clears throat> let's talk about uh, an example. This is a classic example, because this is what the very first um, internet worm, internet attack was in the 1980s. It shut off the entire internet, which is kind of a hard concept to believe. <clears throat> so let me go through this simple piece of code. You have a server that's gonna get data from a client on the network. So here's a piece of code <clears throat> that has a, car a buffer of 100 characters long <clears throat> and has a couple of variables on the stack, I and J. <clears throat> and it calls a function, and if you've programmed in C, you may have seen this function. If you haven't, this is just the function that says get a string from the standard input. So in this case, it was getting a string of input from the network client. <clears throat> now, the thing to notice about this get statement here is <clears throat> There's nothing in that that restricts the length. So as the data comes in, it not only overwrote the buffer, it overwrote the return address on the stack. So you know, we'll jump back. When you call a function, you have the variables, the local variables, i, j, and buffer on the stack. And of course, the return address, when you hit the return statement, is also on the stack. <clears throat> Since this get statement doesn't have anything that restricts the length of the input, which is why this is such a bad function to use. When the input comes in, it starts filling up the buffer, which is good. We expect it to do that, but we gave it extra long input, and now we overflow the return address on the stack. So now, when the program executes the return, it's effectively jumping to whatever address the attacker chose, whatever bytes you put in this message, um, you actually cause this program to jump anywhere you want. In this case, we jumped to a place that convinced the program to become a shell to allow me to type arbitrary commands. <clears throat> so what we have here is that we expected the user to own the bits in buffer, but they also own the bits in the return address. So when it came in, they were able to overwrite this. And this is a very, very simple version of owning the bits. They can be much more complicated. Any questions about this before we talk about more complex alternatives? A uh, question in the chat, Bart. Um, I think this is, is this the, this, just clarifying, this is the attack used by the Morris worm? This is exactly the attack used by the Morris worm. Robert Morris Jr who's actually now a professor at Stanford. He, he, he was rehabilitated. Um, uh, yeah, this is exactly the Robert Morris Jr. work. Robert Morris Sr. was an analyst for the government. He was very proud of his son when he shut down the internet. Okay, so, um, okay, so we'll get a little animation. So this was a simple example. We directly mo modified the internal state we didn't really have to follow through any internal complex controller data flows. Usually you have to, and we owned all the bits in the return address. We didn't have to do something clever, like we can only own part of them. So we had to figure out some clever thing to do with it. There were no timing issues or, or, or races. So, so this was actually a very simple version, but it's, it's, it's very il illustrative of what kinds of things an attacker does and the way they think about it. Now, operating systems and compilers have tried to make these attacks more difficult. So modern systems are harder to attack this way. So for example, when you, every time you run your program, whatever program you're running on a modern Windows or Linux or Mac OS system, um, the location of your code and memory, the location of the stack and memory and location of the memory you dynamically allocate called the heap is, is randomly chosen. So the, the operating system, every time it runs your program, moves this stuff around. So the attacker, the attacker in the stack smashing example had to know what address to put in your return address to jump to. And had to know the address of which function in your code that if it jumped to would cause your program to do something really bad. If the code moves around every time, the attacker doesn't know what address to put in there. So 
red, so ASLR, address space layout randomization, really makes these attacks hard, harder. They're not impossible. There is techniques called heap grooming and other things like that we can talk about that a very sophisticated attacker with lots of resources can use, but it makes these attacks much, much more difficult. <clears throat> there's also internal consistency checks. Um, there's extra flags in the dynamically allocated memory, the heap, and on your stack. So if you overwrite something on the stack, like the return address, before your function returns, it actually checks to see if these values were overwritten. And if they were, it'll set, it'll set a, cause a, a warning message in the program will, will not continue. So stack canaries and heap guards are also there. This is the compiler. The operating system is finally doing things like if, uh, if a piece of memory, a page of memory contains program code, you shouldn't be able to overwrite it. And if a piece of memory contains reading and writing data like the stack or heap, you shouldn't be able to execute code out of that memory. So memory is either writable or executable. That's why it's W exclusive or X, write exclusive or executable. So memory is either writable or executable, but not both. And this idea of having permission bits on memory, read, write, execute, and setting them carefully so you never can write or execute is a, is a really great advance. Intel just put it in their processors in about the last five years. And that's, that's you know, extremely exciting and novel because it means they finally caught up with the 1960s when this stuff was developed. So for some reason, though, this stuff it was, it didn't come out to commodity process, even though the research world has been screaming about this for over 50 years. Okay. Um, so again, um, attackers still find clever ways of doing this, and we have other lessons that we can talk about um, in more detail, but this is, this is the beginning. Okay, I wanna, we wanna do something now and talk about sp specific programming techniques, just two of them. We're gonna talk about two of them. In this case, numeric errors and injection attacks, we have some notes on exceptions that you can read at some other time um, and show you how simple programmer mistakes can allow the attacker in. Just so that's where we're going to go. And the next one's numeric errors, and Alyssa will take over on this one. Yep. So the idea here, we'll start talking about um, some specific um, problems and then ways to uh, mitigate that problem. And for today, we decided to do a numeric error because numeric errors are kind of, um, you know, with a buffer overflow with pointers, we know that pointers are dangerous. We know that we should do, you know, a lot of things to prevent uh, issues with pointers and still we are likely to have uh, some, but, um, you know, integers, there are kind of, uh, kind of innocent and uh, I mean, what could uh, go wrong when a uh, user integers? So we'll start um, with a um, motivation example and I'll go with, uh, I'll go through this example and uh, please let me know if uh, there are any questions before moving forward. So this is an example that we use um, like as, as a quiz because in that a few lines of code there are tons of uh, security issues. But uh, right now we'll focus only on uh, integer related problems. So here we have a function, execuid, whose uh, main goal is basically execute a program I receive as an, as an argument. Here we assume that the, uh, those arguments were validated before uh, calling the function. So just for a uh, I mean, in real life, you don't assume that, but it's just um, for a space a limitation here. So, and the idea is to execute that uh, that program, and uh, but before that, dropping privileges and using the privilege, the user ID and the group ID receive as an argument. So the key here is that we don't want to execute that uh, program as a, as a root user. So we check if the user ID or the group ID are zero, that means they are root, then uh, we fail. We say we cannot execute that as root. 
know, to make sure that we execute that as um, you know, user Elisa, user Bart, or user, any user different than root. And, uh, and then in our program, we like use a H root, that's basically to logically uh, change the root directory. So uh, the root directory here will be, um, will be the one received as an argument and we drop privileges here and we execute the program as um, with, uh, you know, as now as a user Elisa, we execute the program received as an argument. So, so just, just, well, just, just as a bit of uh, fill in here, um, these are two Linux calls or any Unix version calls that uh, tell that change the user ID. So if this was running as root and we're going to start up another program, this would change the user ID to, to the user ID specified new ID and change the group ID, which is another form of privilege to the group ID passed, passed in. So this, so your program now, this is de-escalating, changing your privilege to a lower privilege, which is an important thing that software often does. So here usually we'll give some time um, for uh, you guys to think about the interview related problem, but today uh, we don't have much time. So I'll just uh, jump to the, the answer. And basically the problems here are related to the type of the UID and GID variables. If you see uh, in here, there are defined as uh, integers, but if uh, the system we are running this on has 16 bits, um, uh, 16 bits IDs, which is the type used for UID and GID for the set UID and set GID calls, but integers are 32 bits, then if we have a value like this, or actually any value higher than this, we'll say, oh, this is uh, different than zero. That's fine. But there will be a truncation when uh, calling set UID and set UID. So uh, actually the argument received here will be a zero. And I'll show you that uh, in an animation here. This is one of the values for a problematic that that will pass the test when we are checking if a user ID or group ID are uh, different than zero. That number is clearly greater than zero. But when we truncate it to a 16 bit uh, ID, actually the result is zero. So as a consequence of that, we will be calling set UID and uh, set group ID with zero. So this will be executed as uh, the user root. Uh, are you with me right now at this point? Good time for questions. There's uh, one more in the chat here. Um, how much, and this may be back from a couple of slides, how much reconnaissance is needed by the adversary to figure all this out? So that, that's a good question. Um, sometimes you can, uh, there's a technique called fuzz testing where you can just send random input. This is a favorite technique of attackers. We just send random input to a program. Just send poor weird garbage at it. And if the program crashes or does something really weird, that's an indication that you've stepped outside of their intended behaviors. Then you start playing around with that input, trying to figure out exactly what you did and how you tailored it. So one approach programs do is just attack the program with junk and see if you can get it to squeak. And if it does, if it does squeak or yell, then you try to manipulate that more carefully to figure out exactly where you are. And it might be something like this that gets you there. Uh, otherwise, you may be doing a careful analysis of the code, and then we've got a whole nother discussion that we can teach you. We've got a whole methodology we can teach you about how to do that careful analysis of the code. So that, that's, that's, a good, that's a good topic for another day. A, a follow-on question to that part. Are these programs that you just described readily available? Do your adversaries build them? Um, Sometimes the adversary can get the code, especially in the open source world. Sometimes the adversary can't get the code because you're running on a server. Sometimes the adversaries can only get the machine language binary code and they have to reverse engineer it. But I think the question refers if the attacks are available. Uh, like if you want to inject a return address to a, you know, 
exec code or a system code. I mean, some attacks are available. There's certainly tools like fuzz tools out there that you can try. There's some good uh, open source and commercial fuzz tools you can get for doing security testing. But these tests tend to be very program specific. Okay, back to integers. That example we saw was a synthetic one to um, motivate the topic. But here we have an example of uh, the real world and that was specifically uh, OpenSSH 3.3. So in this case, basically we have an integer uh, and ref initialized to an integer. I mean, that value came from somewhere from a different function. We don't care about it. We have uh, and rest initialized to a certain value. And um, okay. yeah, so so this packet came from the user input from the attacker. So that you're getting an integer out of the user's packet. And then we check if uh, and rest uh, is greater than zero. And in that case, we allocate some memory. And the amount of memory we are uh, allocating is that uh, value and rest times uh, the size of a charge the size, uh, size of a pointer. And that's the amount of money, the of money of memory that will go to uh, the variable response. And then what we're going to do is oops, basically to use that allocated memory to do something else. But uh, there is an issue here. And if uh, the user provides nrest for nrest this specific value, which in hexadecimal is exactly this, and for a system uh, where size of char star is four, when we do this uh, operation, we get uh, this value. But then uh, for xmalloc, the um, size of um, what we receive will be trunk here, you know, after uh, eight, um, seven, eight, it, it, here it will be uh, truncated. So uh, xmalloc will be called with uh, the value zero. And is, so the function uh, is told to allocate uh, zero bytes. So that function will allocate zero bytes and uh, response won't have memory. So um, memory allocated. So there will be a secondary overflow when uh, performing this, uh, this operation. So, and here is no error messages, right? Because, okay, a truncation uh, happened here. And as a result of that, zero bytes of memory were requested. So zero bytes of memory were allocated. Anything else you want to so, add uh, here? So what's the uh, X malic? What is the uh, maximum amount that it can do? Well, it's, it's not a question of X malic. It's a question that the integer that's being used there was a 32-bit integer. Oh, the and so the integer right. overflowed, and x malloc was called. So it's a 32-bit value, so we could only execute right. above 4 billion. But so, this is very language-specific, you know. It, it is. And it's also, like, I don't, I mean, here it's not clear it, response was declared as what? Uh, it's probably declared as an int. And so, but the issue is, there's two issues. One is this is real code. This failed and this caused information disclosure from people using OpenSSH, which was bad. Um, but every language has integer problems. Every language has representation issues. And some languages will automatically move to bigger integers. Some languages will truncate some language. How you declare in every different language is, is quite, is different. And it means you, integers which sound really innocent, as Alyssa was saying, you have to be aware whenever you're declaring a number and you're using it in any kind of in obvious way. And uh, actually integers are not only language dependent, but they're also platform dependent. You could have this. Yes, it's always dependent. That's why I was saying that, you know, we don't know if or just, you know, how was response declared because it could have been a float also. It's, just kind of, you know, in this example. Anyway. Well, it couldn't be a float for this particular use because it's, um, um, but that that's, you know, the, the part that what's, what's, what's important is if you, in certain languages like Java, an int 
is always the same size in every platform. Along is always the same size in every platform. And char is always the same size in every platform. In C or C++, that's not the case. You have to be very careful and actually look at the size. You actually have to write program code to look at the size of them to make sure your code is very defensive. Um, in scripting languages, um, there's all sorts of funny rules that go on with how, um, you know, whether things automatically get resized or don't get resized and what's the default size underneath. And in some scripting languages like Perl, the size can change from platform to platform, like in C. So you have to be really careful. So um, the, the, the main message here is you have to be very defensive when you program using something even as simple as integers. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll get there. So, and uh, this example, I mean, the previous one, as I mentioned, was a synthetic example. And this one is an example from the, from the real world. So, um, the problem with uh, integers, as we were mentioning before, is that, I mean, integer problems happen in a silent way, right? You can have overflow, truncation, or problems arising from uh, mixing signed and unsigned uh, integers, right? And you don't get a kind of an explicit error. The program keeps executing, but something bad happened. So, um, and also, as we were saying before, you may test and make sure that your integers are working fine on one specific platform, but then you move to a different platform and you basically have to start from scratch again. And so do these problems then get minimized when you do containers? Because in containers and you can kind of, you know, underlying, you have a layer so you can if, if maybe you, if, if you're running a server inside of a container and you exploit the server code, you're still going to reveal the data or give the person access to the, to the server in a way it's not exploited not appropriate containers containers don't solve information disclosure issues or or uh, they can protect you from infecting the underlying host maybe though we've shown how to we've shown we just recently showed in a in, an, in a project um, an assessment that we did last uh, half of the year how we could actually get escape that but uh, containers don't prevent you against things like information disclosure or, or information modification So okay. as um, when dealing with uh, integers, okay, make sure you are checking for overflow and you don't mix different uh, type of uh, integers and uh, try to use a uh, system defined types instead of uh, standard types. And also careful when uh, converting integers to uh, smaller integers. But also you need to, um, uh, be careful when using built-in types because those can be uh, problematic as well. And maybe for the sake of time, I'll skip this and uh, just I'll mention also careful, for example, in C-sharp, there is the uncheck uh, a key, a keyword. And if you are doing things in an uncheck way, in this example, it's just a simple uh, multiplication you will get a uh, overflow, right? If we are using maxine times whatever, right? So um, even in languages that are supposed to be, to be providing protection for uh, overflow, right? The, in this case with the uncheck uh, key, uh, keyword, there is a way to escape that. Uh, by, the good news is that in C sharp by default, uh, operations are performed in the, in the check mode, I mean, in the, let's say in the check mode, and in this case, to have the same example, I cannot reproduce the code from the previous slide because uh, if I had the max int and I try to do that, the compiler will detect that that's uh, problematic, right? In that case, if I introduce the, the user provides a max int and we try to perform an operation, we get an overflow. That's what we would like always to happen, but that's uh, not the case. So maybe you want to explain that or you want sure. to skip that? So um, if you think that numbers are trivial, <clears throat> um, there was a very, very famous overflow that happened on June 4th, 1996. Um, and uh, it was basically a floating point number was assigned to a 16-bit integer 
and um, and it wasn't properly checked. Anybody know what this famous, it was on world television. It was the most famous overflow I know in the world. Anybody got an idea what it was? The first mission of Ariane 5, uh, <clears throat> mission 501, um, there was some software that was previously certified um, on Ariane 4 <clears throat> that was moved forward to Ariane 5. Ariane 5 was bigger and more powerful. And it just basically, in the short story, the long story is kind of fun, but the short story is something that was tracking latitude um, the new Ariane missile could have a wider range of orbits, so it could go to higher latitudes, not just around the equator. And this never came up on Ariane 4. It was nowhere documented in the code. But uh, the new rocket was more powerful, so it could reach higher latitudes and caused an overflow on the primary computer. That crashed, caused an overflow on the secondary computer, which had the same code. That crashed, and there were no more computers left. So the missile took a sudden right turn uh, towards civilized areas and they blew it up. So um, this cost $7 billion in lost development costs and three year delay in the RN program because they had to re-engineer to figure out what went wrong and they lost a half billion dollars worth of rocket and payload. So uh, simple integer overflows, um, try to keep you off the front page of the New York Times or or whichever newspaper you want to stay off of, but they're, they're not little things. Okay, any last questions on integers before we move and do a quick tour of injections? Are uh, a couple quick questions here not integer specific. Would you like me to hold them or go ahead? No, let's, let's take them. Okay, um, so what languages are considered the safest to program in? You know, there's, there's, that's a long, long debate story. I would use, so, uh, Perl is disaster, C and C++ are disasters, Java is better, C sharp or better. New languages like Rust or, or Juliet are lovely. I, I, I advocate those though. There's not a lot of software development going on in those languages, but uh, I like those better. Um, Java for conventional language is way better than Perl or C sharp, or uh, Perl or C or C++. So two more questions here. I'm going to sort of synthesize this one. Um, sort of curious where you're getting these code uh, snippets from. Are these public? And then, you know, sort of are there, are there trends uh, related to these, these failures? Um, some of the code snippets, like the OpenSSH one, were public, just like the OpenSSL one. We did an analysis of that one in trying to find the causes. That was the heart bleed. Uh, some of the code snippets we get um, are from assessments that we've done and we're allowed to present the snippets but not the whole code sequence. So they come from a variety of places. Um, the trends are um, the same old vulnerabilities are still around and people keep finding new ones. OSs are more secure, um, but the software people developing has just as many vulnerabilities as it always has. And uh, some snippets, I mean, the ones that are not uh, ours, you can get some from uh, the OWASP uh, site. And um, some others, you can use the, take them from the Juliet test suite, test suite from NIST. And some are in the National Vulnerability Database. So, there. So. Uh, last question, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a liberty and rephrase this one a little bit. With the emergence of sort of the, the web uh, frameworks and new programming languages, Rust, for example, are we making things easier for the people trying to vet them for security, or are we making it easier for the attackers to attack them? How, who's who's gaining? Um, if we're using the good new languages, we're making things harder for the attacker. We're not making it bulletproof. You can still use integers stupidly. You can still use exception handlers stupidly. Um, a lot of other things that we're not talking about today, um, but we are making it harder for the attacker. Um, frameworks, it depends. Um, some frameworks are well designed. And if you stay within the rules of the framework, you can um, make things quite secure. Some frameworks um, are not as well designed. 
and in which case the framework itself is constantly under attack. And also when using frameworks, you increase your software stack and at some point it can get kind of out of control and you don't really know what you have there and you have to make a, a, a strong effort to keep all the layers up to date. We, otherwise, you know, people can use known and uh, known security uh, vulnerabilities on those uh, frameworks to attack you. Yeah, that's a hugely important point. The software, your software supply chain, your 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 dependence list of why is your stupid app on your phone a hundred megabytes in size? There's a lot of software that a developer ha is using. They don't even realize they're using because they're using some packages, and. Um, but you inherit the vulnerabilities of every package that you link into your program, whether you explicitly ask for it or not. So it, that's, a, that's a really interesting, very crucial management issue in the software problem. Okay, let's jump ahead to injection attacks and let's talk about, let's talk about, because everybody's heard about SQL injection, but let's talk about what this is. And I, wanna, I want us to play a little simple game and we're not gonna take a long time for so the question is, can I get the system, whatever piece of the system I'm talking to, to execute commands that were not intended? So can I put words into the system's mouth? So, um, so let's look, so many of you know about the game Mad Libs, where you ask for a list of words, and then your friends all try to come up with cute words, and then those words get filled into a story, and the story ends up quite silly, and everybody ends up laughing, and it's, it's a lot of fun. So if you've never done Mad Libs, you should, you should play it sometime, especially if you've had a little bit of alcohol. Um, so, so let's come up. So here's, here's, a, here's a version of a game. I want to give you an example. Here's the list of words I, I want to come up with. And you can think of your own words, but I'll show you the ones I pick. Pick a vehicle. So obviously I picked a chariot. Pick an outdoor location. Okay, let's pick the rooftop. Food, um, scrambled eggs. I'll pick another food. Pickles. Pickles are always funny for some reason when the kids play this game. I'll pick a sport. Well, the obvious one is javelin throwing. And a relaxing activity, well, standing on our head. You know, if you're into yoga or something, maybe this is relaxing. Okay, so we take these words, and then we, then there's a story which we, we now reveal, and we throw the words into the story. So this really does have something to do with injection attacks. Stay with me. Um, so we fill in the story. We say it was a lovely day for picnics. We packed the chariot, headed to the rooftop. The basket was, was full, loaded full of delicious scrambled eggs and pickles. We spread our blanket for a side to play javelin throwing, then stand on our heads for a while. Okay, fine. Everybody's got some laughs. But, you know, as we're filling in words, we just can take a darker turn. So what happens if I change the last one to relax, period, very important period. Hey, kids, now go rob the bank. Go to the bank and rob it while we stay here. Our story becomes blah, blah, blah. We spread our blanket. We first decide to play javelin throwing and then relax. Hey, kids, now go to the bank and rob it while we stay here for a while. If, you were, if your kids were listening to the story and did everything they, you told them to do, as good kids do when their parents do, um, your kids just went off and committed a felony. So um, what happened here is the creator of the game made assumptions about the words to be provided. And they trusted the person providing the words to be reasonable and not cause something to do something illegal. So in, in other words, they didn't check the input or prevent abuse. So here we, we added an extra sentence that we didn't expect to get added to the story. Okay. So this all sounds, so this all sounds silly, but let's look at this in a little more technical way, because this is actually what's really going on in computers because they're very literal and they do follow our instructions when we tell them. So an injection attack is a string constructed from user input and then it's interpreted by another function. So maybe you're, uh, you're, you're typing in your username in a web form and that string becomes part of a query into a database or becomes part of a command or becomes part of a uh, code. So if, if we allow, we don't carefully check that input, extra meta characters like punctuation, or neutralize it, we can end up with the server doing something uh, I did. And this is serious. This is injection attacks are the most common attacks on the network. So this sounds really simple and stupid and obvious, but people are getting this wrong and getting it wrong again and getting it wrong again. 
So this is really important. So what I want to do is show you, um, let's see, let's go back. So we have our attack surface that we've seen before. <clears throat> so let's say in a web form, I type BART or somewhere in a network packet being sent to a server at the string BART. <clears throat> now, maybe that string BART would be used in a network query to look something up in the database where the user equals my username. Or maybe I'm generating a mail message where the message, where the destination, the mail message is based on the username I type in. Or maybe I'm constructing some code that the program is going to execute on the fly, which has my input in it. So these are all places where data from the attack surface, from some input, is being used inside your program. And if I can manipulate that, then I can do something dangerous. So let's talk about the specific case of SQL queries because they are so common and also we know how to fix these. So if the user input from your user forms, from the input from a database is being used to build a SQL command, it has to be checked or quoted or escaped something so it doesn't get it interpreted as uh, a command to the database. So let's, let's see what this looks like. Here is a simple piece of Perl code. You know, assuming your program has opened up the database and has and has it was database handle. And now we're going to say for this database, I'm going to do a query. So the query is going to be select from all the attributes from a particular table in the database. We'll say table T, whichever that is, where the column in the table, the attribute U, let's say user equals the input that you gave to, you, to the program. So you type in a login on a web form and your login name gets stuck in this query and now presumably the database is gonna to try to look up your user in the database. So now if the input I gave in the web form, which is the thing from one double quote to the other double quote was space, single quote, semicolon, drop table T minus minus. That's a really weird string to type as a username, but if that got put into the query right here, what the query becomes is select from table T where U equals quote space quotes. Well, that will, fit, that will return no entries because there's probably no user with the name space. Then a semicolon and then SQL will execute another command and drop table T. Anybody know what drop table does in SQL? Yeah, it will, uh, the table will be dropped, the table D will be no longer existing. Yeah, it no longer exists. It deletes the table, it deletes the whole table from the database. So if I typed this username in and the data and the program didn't check the structure of this username to make sure it was safe, then we would have deleted the entire user database from the server which would have then made the server unusable and be a great form of denial of service attack. So this is the canonical, this is the canonical attack. Now, oftentimes they're trickier and have, there are more statements involved, but this is the basic core of it. So there is a way to fix this. So we don't say that in security very often, but this is one we know how to fix with great confidence. What you do instead is in the query, this is the stuff in, whoops, the stuff in quotes is what the SQL interpreter is going to process. It's the thing it's going to say is SQL. It's, if there's a value from the user, you don't actually put the string in here and get the string misinterpreted. You basically say, hey, there's a parameter that I want you to use. And it's not, it's, I just want you to look at its value. It's never, it's not SQL. And I put the parameter out here. And so now when SQL process, it says U equals something and simply looks at these bytes as a string to compare to user values. These bytes never get interpreted as SQL. Here we stuck it in the, in the string. It became part of the string and the whole query expanded into this. Here it's just being used as the value and substituted here. These are called prepared statements. And when you use prepared statements, you are highly resistant to SQL injections. So um, 
we have some code examples here. This is examples from real code. It's another form of an attack where um, it's again a login function where we're getting from the user input the user and the password. Um, and then we're constructing a string using uh, concatenating this, the plus sign Java is concatenate with this, with the user variable, and we're concatenating up a, a SQL query that's supposed to be executed. But here, if the user execute puts in some very clever input, which is user equals admin and password equals this funny string here, then up here at the top is what the database actually sees as the string. It says select from the members database table where user equals admin and password equals, well, nothing. So that this will fail or uh, x no. equals x. x equals x is always true. So this will always come back true and always return an entry and always have the login successfully happen. Okay. We can go into more detail here, but we're coming up at the end of the hour. Um, the quick, quick answer to how this works, to how you fix this, is use prepared statements. And the query just has those same question marks in it and the variable set separately. Okay. So um, I think we're going to, we have a lot more material um, that you could, you could look at. And you can find video lectures and text chapters and all this material right here. It's materials we use for our undergraduate introduction to software security course. This isn't quite complete yet. We're still fleshing out some of the chapters here, but this is a great resource. And we'll have time for a few questions, but uh, not too many, depending on how long you want to run. Well, well, let me thank you very much for that. And Diana, why don't we go ahead and, and end the recording now? And I've got a, a couple questions here um, from the chat, which are, is the, the current educational curriculum incorporating this message of defensive coding? Um, in the short answer is probably no. Um, we're busy teaching people how to write compilers, how to write uh, machine learning models, how to write operating systems. Um, we, we rarely get this message encoded, uh, in, included into the curriculum. Um, courses specifically on software security are quite rare. And we've been trying to promote by this website here, um, once it's complete to give instructors materials so and more people will be teaching it. Um, but it really needs to be introduced in every level of the course from the intro first intro programming level through the most advanced courses and not just in security courses. It's, it's, it's insufficient, I believe. And not every student has to take a security course and not every security course spends a lot of time on software security issues. So um, it's, 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 it's worrisome. Vaughn, you're muted if you were meaning to talk. Thank you. Uh, quick last question. Um, are the courses incorporating the new languages that you mentioned earlier as being improved? Uh, very slowly. Very slowly. Um, uh, it, it's, I, I think that's the short, short answer. Um, probably most stu class students are seeing Java which is not a bad language. It's not as good as the newer ones, but it's not bad. Um, so, but the problem really is in the real world, we're writing too much C and C++ code because of operating system designs, legacy, legacy code bases, and so on. And those are causing more. And we really got to kill Perl. It's a disaster. All right. Well, with that, thank you very much for your presentation today. And I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap up our meeting, and we'll look forward to, uh, to seeing the, the fellows next week for Jim Basney talking about identity management. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.